Welcome to the second half of our second meeting. Tell me um, from unit one what you guys came away with or perhaps um, questions you may have um, from the material that was covered in unit one. I'm going to make it an open ended question to start. Well, if nobody else is going to start uh, for me, you know, I, th I think I I get all the Creative Commons licenses, even though I still want to go through their training at some point. But I really have not been clear on that whole attribution piece. So that was new to me. And um, I know that I need to add a bunch of things retrospectively in our repository. So that's kind of a huge project um, upcoming. And then, so nowadays we, we go with the 4.0, is that what it is? Yeah, that's the latest version. So that's what we, mm -hmm. like when you do the attribution. So like if it was created some years ago, then that's why it might say Creative Commons 2.0. 2 that's right, yeah. Okay. And in the co-op we're licensing uh, works CC by, just to right, right. mention I, that again. <laughs> no, I, but, yeah. but there's no need to go back to an older work to update from 2.0 to 4.0, right? There's no need. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> while, we're, while we're on that topic, um, you know, stuff that, issues that come up here with that are, of course, the commercial element. You know, I, we don't really, <laughs> faculty, when they usually come in, don't necessarily, they say, oh yeah, I've heard of Creative Commons, but they don't really, understand the intricacies of it and how each flavor has a different uh, restriction or non-restriction. And it's, I think the, the commercial one is the one that gets people most uneasy. So, you know, we, when we, not in this project, but in other projects, we sort of left it up to them and said, you should make your own determination because as soon as they hear Oh, if it's CC by, and I like to be honest with them, I'm not going to pretend that this isn't a possibility. Cengage can take your book and repackage it. Uh, I don't know many authors who like that when I tell them that. So, um, I, you know, what's, I know you've thought a lot about this and talked a lot about it, and I know why it's CC by, I, I understand, but the, it's the commercial thing, I think, that's really the sticking point. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Jeremy, and I understand it. I actually just um, emailed Cable Green at Creative Commons with that scenario. Um, so let's say a faculty member puts a CC by NC license on the work. Would it be possible for Cengage to put it in their platform anyway, but not charge for it? Um, yeah. And uh, my understanding from our email exchange is that is possible. Um, so the CC by NC may not protect authors in the way that they imagine or that they think. Um, I really appreciate these concerns. I, I, I think it's an ongoing conversation to land on the right license. Um, so it does, I, I, go ahead. Not, it doesn't mean that they have to ask first. That's right. If they're not, they're not charging for that particular book, um, they can include it. So it's, you know, it's one thing to sell the book. Like, okay, I'm, I, you know, this book is CC by license. I'm going to create a print copy and charge $100. That obviously is not allowed with the license. Nice. But, but from what I understand, you know, some uh, uh, Cengage or another sort of provider who has a platform who's ingesting a lot of content, they may be charging, you know, they're charging for this particular package over here. They can ingest other open content and not charge for it and be within the parameters of the license. Was what I understood from our email. But, but then once they charge, that's when. If it's a charge for that particular book, right. But they could still be making it available. Right. Yeah. Mm. But you're right. It's not, the, the money's not going in their pocket, you could argue. Great questions. Um, and this, 
Yes, go ahead. Sorry, this is Marilyn. So obviously continuing on that same vein, <laughs> um, uh, wondered about the SA part of the license, if um, if that would have any impact then on what the publisher could put into that book. Um, but I'm going to surmise based on what you just said that they would be sharing alike, meaning openly not charging for it for that particular piece. So that wouldn't even uh, keep them from using that content. I just wanted to bring that part up. Yeah. It's just really tough because we've it had, as, as Jeremy said, you know, we've, got, we've had numbers of faculty here really kind of uh, about the CC by right with what's yeah. happening. Yeah, I appreciate that. It is tough. And any conversation about licenses tends to be a bit of a rabbit hole as well, which is another tough thing, like both amongst us and when you're sitting there talking um, to faculty about it. So it's an ongoing conversation for us as well. Um, but right now, part of the reason why we entered into the cooperative with the CC by license is for simplicity's sake, especially for encouraging remix and you guys know. Um, Adam, I saw that you unmuted. Perhaps you had a question as well. Uh, yes. Well, I have more down that rabbit hole and I have other takeaways that are unrelated, but um, do you have a preference? Should I continue on the licensing track? <laughs> We can, we can peek down the rabbit hole a little longer and then maybe move on to your um, other takeaways. Okay, so two things I've been wondering about with non-commercial is can someone make, so if I, could I take someone's CC non-commercial work and build it as a non-profit print-on-demand option? So I wouldn't make any money on it. It would just be the pay for the printed, so person, people would pay for sure. the print. Yes. So is yes. that allowed in NC? That is, yes. yes. Okay, and then my other question was, um, if I'd find CC zero images mm -hmm. um, that aren't even CC by, and then use them in some learning object, um, like a Captivate file or a video or something, um, should I attribute the fact that they are CC zero, or can just not mentioning it be legitimate? I would love to hear what the librarians in the room have to say on this. Uh, my thought is you're not required to, but then nobody knows where it came from. And so then you're like, well, is it okay if I use this again? I don't really know the origin story. So even though you don't have to with CC0, I think it's really helpful for downstream users, but other people, please chime in. I, I prefer that option to identify in case somebody else wants to find it. Cool. Kathy, it looks like you're talking, but we can't hear you. Uh oh. <laughs> Kathy, were you trying to say something? Sunny, I heard you fine. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that looked like a never mind. I think that was a never mind wave. Okay. <laughs> Adam, um, do you want to mention some of your other takeaways? Uh, one more licensing question on share alike. Oh. Um, so if I take an image uh, that is CC by share alike, and uh, put it into a book. That whole book has to become CC by share alike because that one piece is in it, correct? Yep. Even if it's uh, CC by non-commercial share alike, the whole thing has to become non-commercial? The whole thing has to have the share alike on it. Share alike is really a, a stickler. Yeah. Marilyn? Okay. Marilyn, are you giving me a side eye? Do I have that right? <laughs> OK. Um, um, all right, and so then I have a lot of these questions. One more, if it's a CC by um, that has been, so if someone creates the first open book and then someone modifies it, and then I use the modified version, does CC by mean I have to attribute the original person and the modifier all the way down the track? These are great questions, Adam, really great questions. Um, does anyone else want to take it? Marilyn, you unmuted. I believe so. Yes, that's what I, my understanding is from talking with Cable about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you and can have a long list of, foot, of little footnotes at the bottom of yeah. each page. It takes up uh, your whole page. After <laughs> yeah. And then your questions also speak to sort of the compilation um, approach, which um, 
gosh, I haven't thought about this in a while, so I, I will trust people in this room to correct me if I get it wrong. But if you are trying to combine different licenses, again, this is why we try to keep things simple with CC BY, um, you can't have, it, it's, it's best not to have different licenses kind of on the same page. So you can, you can compile them to differentiate, you know, this is the license of this particular content. Does that ring true for anyone or does anyone want to chime in there? Mm -hmm. Okay, I got a mm hmm <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> okay. And then my last question is, does a fair use clause of copyright have any overlap or application with um, Creative Commons or not? Yeah, CC. Hmm. <clears throat> I can chime in. It, it depends on the context. You could use a fully copyrighted image if one of the four factors of fair use was applied to that image. So right, so I guess critiquing that image, if you just wanted a picture of a flower and it was from Corbis, you couldn't use it under fair use. But if you were saying this photographer, you know, was, it, you have to apply the, the test the fair use test to that image and say, does this fall, yes or no? So I guess that applies to copyright irrespective of Creative Commons. Yeah. So copyright is more restrictive. So if fair use applies, it would also apply to any CC license? Yeah, theoretically, yeah. Okay. Those are all my licensing questions. Okay, great. I think we should move away from licensing, although if you have additional licensing questions, please post them to the Google group. There's lots of um, experienced librarians uh, in that group who can guide you. Um, now we'd like to transition a little bit into how an open textbook is different than a monograph. This is a really important takeaway um, that we've already talked about in our first meeting, but that I hope you got from um, reading through unit one and uh, watching Dave's video in particular. If you only have a limited amount of time, I hope you watch uh, Dave's video about different textbook elements. Can a few of you just chime in on um, elements that you, you know, just kind of throw it out there that are different than what you'd find in a monograph that you typically see in a textbook. Maybe for those of you who publish textbooks, things that you remember, um, or if you are uh, uh, I was going to say a fan. I'm just going with it. If you're a fan of a particular discipline or subject area and you can think of like how books in that discipline are often structured, um, I would just like to sort of get that part of our brain going before um, I hand things over to Elvis and Mike. Well, I, I really like that section um, on openers, closers, and integrated pedagogical devices. And um, um, a text, the textbook that I'm working on, a couple of them, uh, we do start with um, um, learning outcomes, but um, I like the uh, using for openers, um, um, you know, the uh, devices such as introductions or maybe even a case problem. I'd like to discuss that with uh, the authors that I'm working with. Great ideas here, which I'm hoping to bring to them. It's, it's something that they, they know and they use all the time in their commercial textbooks, but it's not when they start writing their own textbook, they're not thinking in that way, uh, in that structured way. So that's, but, so without understanding why they like their old commercial textbook, these are the elements that they're using and they're liking, but they're not fully aware of it. Yeah, that's a great point. And so can you imagine how you might talk with your author about her project to kind of get, um, get thinking more about it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm trying to get organized right before my meeting with her today. <laughs> But um, I like the, um, the sticky notes. So what I, I, I'm gonna do some colored sticky notes and um, um, first of all, help her with the structure and then have a list of the um, um, optional openers and closers and, and basically we'll go through them and see uh, what, which of those elements really appeal to her. But I'm thinking maybe just limit it to maybe two or three per, <laughs> Per mm -hmm. category, because I, I, 
Right. <laughs> I don't want to go crazy and I don't want her to go crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that, that selecting the ones that work best uh, is a good um, plan. Mm -hmm. I wonder if our instructional designers who are here have any thoughts on this particular process or how you might go about it. Um, this is very much in your, your ballywick. Uh, I love the whole elements section and, and it struck me that um, all of the structuring method is a really good way to explain course design as well. Um, and like you're saying, what people don't notice they like about good textbooks is also what they don't like it, no, don't notice they like about good courses. Um, and just that it's instructional design. So a textbook is basically information with instructional design applied to it, um, whereas a monograph is more just information um, conveyed. So I want to use a lot of the uh, sticky note methods with subject matter experts in course design let alone, and just make a course feel like a whole big good textbook with other readings and videos and activities as, as the uh, supplemental um, content. That was my main takeaway. I love it. Cool. That's great to hear. And I think we'd all love to hear updates too. So Sunny, after you meet with your author or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Adam, as you implement some of these things, I mean, please keep us posted either in future meetings or in the Google group, both in terms of like, this went really well and I'm excited, or this was a total bomb and I'm not going to try it again. So, um, <laughs> oh yeah. There was, the, there was that one mention where somebody was sued on the format mm. of the textbook. I mean, that just seemed very, very bizarre that you could, you can't copyright a, you know, the elements of a, of a textbook or can you? Yeah, that is a tough story. Um, but and I, it, if I remember right, it's been a while since I learned through that or read through that. But if I remember right, it was settled out of court, so we're not totally yeah, sure what yeah. happened there. I don't know yeah. what the solution was. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing your takeaways and your questions. Um, I'm now going to hand things over to Elvis. He's going to talk a little bit more about working with faculty to ensure what they're working on is a textbook and not a monograph. Right. So, oh, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to start by, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, monographs that we worked here at Scribe, just so that you have an idea, something visual uh, to get, um, to wrap your head around um, monographs. I know we know what they are, but sometimes uh, we'll look at a book and it has some of the elements, like it'll have like lists and it'll have like sidebars and we'll say, well, that looks like a textbook, but it might still be a monograph because the sidebar might not actually be encouraging the reader to interact with the content. The lists themselves uh, may just be there as part of the running text and things like that. They're not like actual exercise questions and things like that. So I'll go ahead and share my screen now. And got these samples ready. So cure it up here. So as you can see, I'll just put this in uh, this larger view here. Um, you'll have your standard uh, half title page, your title page, which is common to most books. Um, you'll have you know copyright information, table of contents. But already in the table of contents, you can see that things aren't separated into like units or parts. And all you have is pretty much chapters. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so you'll see here, you'll have the acknowledgments. And then as we go through, we're not going to go through the entire book, but you'll see that all you have is text and some heads. And then you'll have some elements like block quotes and things like that, but it's all pretty much straightforward text where, um, where you to give this to a student or give this to a reader, uh, what you'll have is you'll just have them reading chapter by chapter and not really interacting uh, with the content. When we think of a textbook, what we're really thinking of is something uh, where the students are not only reading through the materials and learning it that way, but also being, I guess you could say, challenged in a sense by, you know, questions at the end or um, by no noting right at the beginning that there are, you know, these are the objectives for the rest of this chapter or this is what we hope you're going to understand by the time that you're done 
uh, with this chapter. And as you can see, this is pretty straightforward. There are no images, there are no sidebar. You'll have your notes at the end as most uh, monographs do and most textbooks also do. They have that um, in common, but you'll have this and then you'll see this sort of repetition throughout the rest of the monograph. So I'll close out of that one and open up the second one and we'll see that it looks pretty similar. I'll just scroll up to the top here. And you'll see that the design, even though it's slightly different, different fonts, um, this one has actual you know, part numbers and then things divided, um, the parts divided into chapters. Uh, but again, it's pretty standard, pretty just text as we scroll through it we'll see block quotes and we see that the difference between this and the other other monograph that we looked at is really just uh, some design choices when it comes to uh, the uh, the fonts the you know and like font size and things like that um, do you have any questions up until now I think we're all good feel free to interrupt me at any time if something comes up or you want me to go back and see something. So now we're going to look at a textbook that is actually, um, this is the first one, right, Karen, the first OTN textbook. This one's from uh, Portland State. Um, we worked on this together with Karen Bjork, which we'll be hearing from um, in uh, later classes, but you'll see, let me actually switch this view so it's easier. Um, you'll see that already you have things divided um, into subsections for the chapters. Um, you have uh, these parts and you have sort of like everything's divided much in, in much smaller chunks. Um, so we'll go down a little bit further. And you'll have this epigraph and we looked at this during our first class, but we'll just take a, a quicker look here. And already we have our notes. Things are already sort of designed differently. It's a two column um, layout rather than just a single column layout, just so that the information can be displayed in a different in a different sense. And so you'll hear you'll have the sidebars, which we saw in our first class, and things of that nature. We'll have exercises, and so you'll see that here this isn't just a list of questions so that the student can read it and then just move on. These are actually calling for the student to take the information that they have already gleaned from reading the chapter and apply it to something um, in their course. And so you'll also have these quizzes, which in the case of this book are um, a little bit more interactive and have the students thinking outside of the box using the information already um, in the chapter. Um, so you'll have lists and you'll have quotes like we have saw in the monographs, but you'll, you're already seeing that there are these other uh, pedagogical elements uh, included um, in each chapter. And so, as you can already see, there's um, something that just pops out at you when you're looking at a textbook versus uh, a monograph. Uh, when you're looking at a monograph, um, you're just faced with the content and that's it. Here, you're faced with um, different elements that sort of bring out uh, the information for the student and help the student, as I've said, and I'll repeat this often, interact with the, uh, with the content. So I'll go ahead and close out of that and stop screen sharing. And so if we look through what we took away from uh, unit one, we see that um, open textbooks um, don't need to, and now we're gonna shift a little bit towards um, the difference between you know, the purchased commercial textbooks and open textbooks, um, they don't need to be um, inferior. Um, in fact, um, what we saw in unit one and from the research that has been done, uh, most people see that they're e either equal or um, sometimes even superior to, um, and speaking of open textbooks here, are um, equal or superior to uh, what you can purchase at you know, the bookstore or, or via um, any other commercial outlet. Um, and the reason for this is that I think as, as, as we look through unit one and, and through what we're discussing now, I think open textbooks provide a flexibility that uh, purchase textbooks don't because once you go through the entire process, it's sort of like this is almost set in stone until you get this new edition out and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, open textbooks allow the instructors to really take the material that they need. And as we saw in a couple of those videos that they allow, allows the instructor to go through and insert um, you know, things that they found in their ongoing research 
and whatnot and really make the class something um, just better, I think, for the student. Um, also, uh, is just the fact that when you're looking at um, an open textbook, you're looking at something that has been produced, but at the same time is uh, flexible and sometimes even cheaper, as we've already discussed, for the students, which is something that's important uh, considering that students are often faced with this burden of, of um, exorbitant textbook costs. Um, so um, we're providing then through uh, open textbook something that is of equal or superior value at a uh, lower cost to the students, which helps them get better grades and, thing, and so on and so forth, as we saw in, uh, in unit one. So I want to talk a little bit about just working with uh, faculty um, and just getting them on board to not producing monographs. So as you saw, I gave you a couple of examples. That's a good way to start talking to an author um, or a creator to you know, create a textbook, say like, look, this is an example. This is something um, what we uh, what we want uh, from you. Um, but there are other elements and you can also provide them with that list of openers and closers um, and things like that. So that way, when you're speaking to the author, they're seeing what their book can be. Um, you don't want to just go in and talk to the author and say, hey, don't produce a monograph and then just walk away because they're not gonna understand it. They might just say, hey, I'm producing a book. It has text and heads and I have a couple lists in there. So that must be a textbook. Um, and we want to give them sort of a basis for them to really imagine their book being the best book that it can be. And so I'm gonna, mm -hmm hammer on that a little bit, but uh, the truth is, is that when you're speaking with authors and you're speaking with faculty, um, you're really trying to, in a sense, sell them. I don't want to use that word, but sell them on producing this content in a way that's going to help readers, help students, help the ones that are going to consume um, their book and their ideas and, and the things that they know are good for them to produce and give uh, to other people. So what we have is, is that you just want to give them these examples so that they have something like, hey, wow, this looks really great. Like you can look, give um, this, um, this textbook and give that to them and say like, look at this, like your book can do this. And there are other elements that you can add to, you know, for your specific field. And really when you're speaking with faculty and instructors and those who are creating the textbooks, you really want to tell them like, hey, you can do a lot with this that's going to help your students and help the people that are going to be consuming um, your book. And so um, along with that, what you want to do is you want to set these expectations early on. You want to really um, talk to them. And I'll say this a lot that when you're managing a project and when you're developing it, you're, you're going to see that you're going to be spending a lot of time at meetings and talking to the authors and back and forth and all this. And it's going to seem like it's so uh, front loaded that it seems crazy. You're like, wow, if this is this bad here in the beginning, now what's it going to look like at the end? But that's actually not true. It seems counterintuitive, but the more you do up front, the easier it is at the end. Because you don't want, and, and I believe Michael will, will attest to that once uh, his, his time comes up, you know, you don't want uh, an author saying, well, you know, you never told me to do this or this other thing, and now we have to do it in typeset, and we have to add a whole new chapter, or we have to add all this when things are already close to, you know, the end. You want to have all those conversations and have things, and preferably in writing, um, and, you know, just in conversations, um, you know, notes, anything. Um, so that way, when you're speaking with, um, with the authors and you're telling them, look, um, we are expecting this, they might say, well, I need to get back to you. Well, then you get back to them and you have another meeting. And then if they have asked for another meeting, you have another one. But it's better to do all of that right at the beginning than try to do that at the end. Because, um, you know, we here at Scribe, um, we've, we've dealt with some with issues like that where, you know, we're working with a client and then, you know, the author says, oh, actually, I want to add this new content, but the files are already uh, typeset and now it's, it's a lot more difficult. It costs a lot more. And so it's just um, a bigger, I don't want to say hassle, that's not the right word, but it's just a bigger hurdle to, to overcome. Uh, meanwhile, it had, you know, in the beginning, it would have been, hey, we want to add this new chapter and the files are still, you know, in that development concept phase. Then it's like, hey, yeah, sure, go ahead and add that in. Um, we'll be able to 
deal with that. So again, you want to, when you're talking with faculty and instructors and those who are creating the textbooks, you want to give them samples and you want to tell them like, hey, this is what we're expecting of you and have those conversations, have that back and forth uh, as long um, as you need to, because it's better to have things pretty much set up early on than to do that uh, towards the end. Karen, I saw that you unmuted yourself. I don't know if you want to hop in and, and tag team. You're it. <laughs> okay. I actually wanted to invite um, people who've been working with authors who are here to maybe talk about the back and forth that they've gone through or to sort of give a real life story to what Elvis is explaining. Um, Kathy or Jeremy, for example, you've both worked with authors on creating uh, textbooks and just thinking about how kind of the, the structure came to be. Do you have anything uh, you might be able to share? No, we still can't hear you, Kathy. <laughs> but we want to hear you. Right. Okay. <laughs> I guess I can pop in and share a little bit while, while Kathy gets, uh, I think she's going to get a new headphone or I don't know if she's going to go away. Um, but um, oh, she has to go to another meeting. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Oh, there you go. I just saw it on the chat. Okay. So uh, when working with, with Kathy, we had actually um, a lot of back and forth um, between Scribe, us, and, um, and UConn, and then UConn with the, um, with the author, uh, because we needed to get things in place before we actually went into production and before we um, went into anything like copy editing or anything like that. And so um, just having those back, back and forth, it, it may seem, as I said, that it's like it took a, lot, a, a while, but now as uh, UConn is working on typesetting uh, their book, they, they're working with a file that they know is close to final. So they're not going to uh, receive any unexpected surprises, surprises which, are, which was actually my next point, which if you handle things in the beginning and you're working with the authors and you're telling them, hey, look, we want you to do a textbook, you're not going to get a surprise where you're like, okay, I'm going to leave this author alone for you know, six weeks and then they're going to come back and there's, you're going to get a monograph. Um, what you really want is you want to just really talk to them um, and check in often, check in as often as possible. Um, you know, you don't want to be a bear on people, but you do have to sort of as a project manager, and if that's the role that you're going to choose to take on, that is part of your responsibility to really talk to them and be on top of the authors and say, hey, you know, give me a sample. Let me see what you're working on. So um, that you know where you're not going to get a surprise later on. Um, I think that that has happened um, often where um, you'll have an author will say, okay, I'll work on this. And they work on it and they've gone ahead and finished their work. But by the time it gets to you, now you have a lot more work to do to get this into the shape of what uh, you're expecting or what you needed. So you always want to have, um, again, this like open communication with uh, the author or the creator of the textbook and actually ask them for samples constantly. Uh, say, you know, as, as a good example, you can say, okay, let me see your chapter one, if that's what they finished. And you look at it and you can give them feedback and then ask later on for chapter three. So you don't have to say, oh, give me the next chapters to make sure that you're working. You say, hey, you know, when you're done with chapter three, send that to me. And there you'll be able to see if they're actually applying your feedback or if they're, you know, disregarding it for a reason. Sometimes it seems like they're just disregarding it for, you know, for the sake of disregarding it because they don't agree. Uh, but that might not be the case. They may not just have understood the way that you communicated it, or they may not see it as something um, essential. And so they're, you know, going down that route, or they were probably even waiting for um, to send you the next chapter. So what you want to do is you want to always um, like hammer this point home, like sort of what I'm doing now and just say, hey, like we're producing a textbook, not a monograph, and then ask for those samples so that you can say, hey, look, this is great. This is wonderful. Provide that positive feedback, but then also say you need to include like some a summary at the beginning of each chapter because your readers are going to want to know what they're going to get into. And you see you phrase it in such a, in such a way um, that it's focused on the end consumer of, you know, the the project, the book, uh, because after all, that is why we're doing it this way, right? And it's not going down the commercial route or anything like that. We want to make it accessible to the, um, 
you know, to the readers, accessible to the students. We want to make it easy for them to like really ingest this information because after all, um, you're talking to people when you're speaking with authors that want to share the information and teach in such a way that that, um, how can I say it, that then students can receive and then apply and then grow from and all this. It seems like really big conceptual stuff, but it really is what drives people to do, you know, what they do. It drives them to teach, to do, to write these books in the first place. Uh, Karen, I saw you're unmuted, so I'm going to tag you back in. Yes. Well, um, I appreciate your enthusiasm <laughs> on this topic. <laughs> Clearly your experience in working with authors. <laughs> um, you know, and we're, we're talking about elements and making sure that they're present in the textbook. And part of that is going to be accomplished through composition, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a technical process that we'll start learning a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. But I think now I'd like to turn it over to Michael who can talk a little bit more about how these elements relate to structure and composition. Um, again, we'll get into the details. We're just kind of going for the conceptual overview at this point to connect the technical stuff that we're learning later with this big picture structure of the of the textbook. Right. Um, right. So like Elvis said, um, the it's important to um, start you have your authors structure their chapters so that uh, the the their knowledge can uh, get to the readers uh, most efficiently, and that means every every paragraph they type has a specific job to do. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and what we call composition is essentially just identifying what job each piece of your text needs to do in order to transmit the knowledge from the author to the student. Okay, that sounds really big and abstract, but it um, you already know. Um, what you already know this <laughs> um, because people do it instinctively. Um, it's just a matter of we're going to be doing it in a specific language so that um, it's easier for everyone along the entire relay race of getting this book from the author's head into some sort of format that other people can read, there's going to be a lot of people involved in that process. And if all those people are speaking the same language, you're going to save yourself and the author and everybody else a lot of headaches. And that is what we, uh, what the purpose of the uh, composition process is. So um, I'm actually going to ask Elvis to share his screen because uh, he has the images that I want to show you. Uh, I don't have the images that, uh, because Elvis is on Microsoft uh, Word on a PC, and most of you are also work on a PC. I work on a Mac, and if I show you my screens on a Mac, it will confuse most of you. Um, and that's not what we want. We want nice, clear communication at all stages, including this. So, um, uh, this, inferring and explaining, is the textbook that, uh, Elvis was showing you the finished version of before. Uh, and so uh, I'm assuming that this is uh, pre-composed. It was actually, I was going to um, wait yeah. for a pause, but this was because um, um, Portland State is part of the OTN. They actually chose to compose this in-house. And what we did is we uh, just cleaned up the composition and gave feedback on that. So this is actually the work of um, the team at Portland State, and they've already gone ahead and, and applied things um, here. Okay, uh, can you scroll down so that we can see the start of a chapter and also turn on uh, draft view? All right, so um, this is the only technical term that I'm really gonna introduce this week is uh, draft view in Microsoft Word is, um, as you can see, it's under uh, view on your ribbon up top. Uh, you can see where Elvis's cursor is there under draft. And what that does that's, uh, is over on the left-hand margin, you can see there's in, this, in the actual text area, there's the preface. And over on the 
uh, left-hand margin, there's what's called CTFM. Don't worry about what the actual codes are right now. We'll be going over that in a future week. But um, you can think about it as there's the text in the main part of the screen, and then there's uh, the little tag that tells everyone that's going to work on this, including all the computer programs that are going to eventually work on this program, what the job of that text is. So uh, that preface is the chapter title for the front matter of a preface. And the uh, language, the tag that we use to denote that job of being the chapter title of, the, of a front matter section is CTFM. Like I said, we'll go over all the specific tags um, in more depth later on. This is to just tell, to show you the idea of um, you're using uh, style sheets in Microsoft Word to uh, label each piece of text as what job it's doing in the book. Um, if you look a little farther down, there's the words practical epistemology. Um, that is the first, the highest level head in the book, okay? We call it an A head. The lower level heads are B heads and C heads and D heads. Um, and so over in the left hand column, there's the little tag that says AH. Um, that would um, label this as the job that this text is doing is that this is an A head. It's splitting up, um, you know, it's a head, it's marking the subject of what the text is to come. Uh, when you get this, sorry, I please say one thing. Um, if you want to think about it in the sense of what we've just reviewed in unit one, uh, the heads serve almost as the uh, dividers for the section. So when you're thinking of a chapter, the chapter is that larger body of text, and then the head divides into a subsection, and then a B head or a second level head um, will divide it into a subsec uh, sub subsection, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think we have all the way down to E head um, in SCML, but that's technical. We're not going to get into that yet. Uh, but uh, this, if you can just think of it in the sense that this is the way that you can divide um, your uh, chapters or you can tell your authors to divide their chapters into different sections that discuss uh, different, um, different focuses of, their, of that particular chapter. Right, um, yes, if you're thinking about your outline, the outline of the book is um, your table of contents and these are the levels of the outline and the text in between these heads fills out uh, the outline, for, um, you know, is the meat on the bones that are the outline. Um, however, when you get these books from your authors, chances are um, they will not have, um, they will have probably put structure on it because um, they're all trained professionals. <laughs> Um, they will have done it instinctively, um, but they may not have identified that structure of, of what job each of those pieces of text does in a way that is clear and easy for everyone else who's working on the book to understand. Um, and so when you're looking at their very first sample that, uh, like Elvis said, get a sample of a chapter they've already finished, look at it, um, Actually, scroll up just a little bit, Elvis. Um, at the beginning of this preface, there's an epigraph, okay? Uh, an epigraph is generally a quote from another well-known um, uh, source or less well-known source um, and generally has an attribution at the end of it. Um, these are very common throughout all kinds of uh, uh, books, textbooks and monographs. Um, but not everyone knows to call them out. Um, so you might see this uh, rendered in italic um, at the beginning of a chapter, they've taken a quote for th that uh, supports, uh, supports the subject of their chapter. Um, and then what you'll, you would be doing in the composition process is going, oh, well, look, that's italic. It, uh, that tells me that the author meant something different by it. And then you look at what it is. Oh, well, it's a quote from another source. 
it's at the beginning of a section, that's probably an epigraph. And then you would look up, okay, well, what's the technical term for the epigraph? You would see that it is this EPF for epigraph first line. And again, we'll get into the specifics later, but what you're doing is you're looking at what the authors provided you, asking yourself, what job does that do uh, in, the, in the chapter, and then tagging it as such. And I think an important distinction that Mike is talking about is the difference between structure and rendering. So this is really the process of applying structure to a document, not just how it's going to look. So I think we've all probably had to fiddle with documents um, with bold and font sizes and italics to try to get it to communicate what we want it to. But that is not providing structure. Um, it's just changing the way it looks. And so it usually introduces a lot of inconsistency to the document rather than telling the document, hey, whenever you see a header or an A head, it's always going to appear this way. Um, so you're not changing the appearance, you're, you're implementing structure to the document. Absolutely. And quickly, Michael, I just yes. put up an example of like, for example, what you would have um, like receive from a, an author, um, you'll say, you'll often see that they mark things, sometimes it, via fonts, via italics, via bold, as we have here, um, or they'll indent it, or they'll do something to the text, but they will not have like applied uh, the style. And so um, this is often what, where you can either send it back to the author and say, okay, are you saying that everything that's bold um, and centered is ahead and have that sort of conversation uh, with them just so that you can keep them um, in the loop. And it also makes things a little clear because you never want to try to just guess at things um, that an author is trying to do because sometimes they'll do this and then right after the same subhead will be you know, in bold or something, and it'll be the same size as the other one, but it's really a subhead. Um, so um, I'll throw it back now to you, right. Mike. Um, um, yeah, I wanted yeah. to uh, throw it back to Karen, actually, because I think I've said what I needed to say. And I think Sunny has a question. Okay. So we're yeah. throwing it all over the place. It's just yeah. back and forth. <laughs> All right, quick question. Um, so this this is, um, I haven't downloaded SAI, and I don't think you have it activated in that screen. So is that a feature of uh, MS Word draft where it identifies the tag in the left left column? Because that's very useful. So uh, Yes, that's a default uh, function of Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. that draft okay. view. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I can actually quickly just show um, how you can get that, um, depending on your version of Word. Um, mm -hmm. All you have to do is just go to File. I believe it's Options. Mm -hmm. Options. I believe it's under proofing. Hold on, let me actually find it now. There is an option in draft view. Here it is. Um, so you go to File, uh, Options, go to Advanced, and then this um, where it says Style, Area, Pane, Width in draft and online and outline views. Oftentimes okay. that's set to zero, just mm -hmm. uh, set it to one or, or some other number, larger number, and that will appear. So that, as Michael said, is a default um, Thank you. Uh, word. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and just uh, another big takeaway from what Michael was saying um, is that since within the co-op, you're probably going to be working with proofreaders or copy editors or designers. This again is creating a shared language for everyone in that production chain. Um, and it's another reason why we encourage you to invite other people in your organization if you are working in a team so that they can also learn that sort of shared language. Um, but do not despair if, uh, if you are a team of one. Okay, we only have a few minutes remaining. Um, some of the other key information covered in the first unit included diversity, equity, and inclusion, universal design and accessibility. So just broad notes on accessibility. Um, it is certainly baked into anything we're making in the cooperative. Um, Elvis or Mike, can you just say a little bit briefly about uh, the scribe accessibility process? So I'll, I'll start. Um, 
when we are using these tags, and again, we're going to get into the technical details. You don't have to worry about this now. Uh, but when we use these tags, we're actually uh, already building in accessibility. We actually have accessibility styles for specific things uh, that are required for, I believe it's HTML5 that uses uh, certain accessibility semantic tagging. Um, and so we have styles for that. But our styles just naturally lend themselves to being able to uh, provide accessibility for um, um, for your work or for your project. So for example, um, we're working on now, and I believe that the Digital Hub now does it. I have to check in on that. But um, you can actually maintain the alt text for an image throughout the development of uh, your book. Again, don't quote me on that because I do have to check in on that, but that was something that we were working on. And if you saw the video on accessibility from John in Unit 1, he mentioned it, that that was something that we were developing. Uh, so now um, that's sort of what we're, we're thinking of. Like we, whenever we're applying this structure, we're actually making this text uh, more accessible um, right from the get-go. I don't know if Michael wants to add um, any more to that. Oh, uh, just that... Uh... The uh, accessibility tools like uh, enhanced screen readers and the like are going to be looking for the information of what's the job of this piece of text so that I can display it in this special way that will um, help people understand it or, you know, read if they're, you know, reading it out loud, they're going to be looking uh, in some form for what the job of that text is. So really, we're all talking about the same thing with accessibility. Yeah, it comes back to structure again. Thank you for adding that. So in terms of DEI, um, it may be possible to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in your publishing program, perhaps through your request for proposals. Um, it's also something to be mindful of as you work with the author on developing the text when considering what examples are being shared, what kind of case studies are illustrating um, the points in a chapter. Um, are there local and regional scenarios and settings that would be most effective um, for, you know, what you're talking about um, in the textbook? So, you know, for example, there are some textbooks being added to the Open Textbook Library that are regionalized. Um, there's nutrition textbooks specific to Hawaii. Um, there have been some finance textbooks that originated in the United States and then were localized to Canada, for example. And so these are important things to keep in mind as you're working with the author to really think about um, the students at your university, you know, what are their issues in their lives? Um, and then if you're able more broadly, you might try to think more globally in terms of being inclusive. So um, I just raised that in terms of a real opportunity, especially in the developmental phase of these projects to do more and, um, you know, do your part in providing a more um, diverse and equitable landscape in, in what we're publishing. Is there anyone who would like to um, add to that or have ideas or any questions in these last four minutes uh, before we depart about anything that we've covered today for that matter? Um, <clears throat> this, this may be out of sequence, but um... I do have a link to um, certificates, CC certificate training that you can get at Co Creative Commons for people who want to explore the rabbit hole. May I share? Please, <laughs> thank you. All right. I had a question about that SAI ribbon. Um, so I went and got to the point where, it was all last week, so I've already forgotten, but I mean, I could, I could get in to scribe but I didn't do that last step because I think there was some comment that we were going to be doing it together or it'll be. Yeah. Yeah. Down the road. It is. It is down the road, Myra. If you are really eager to check it out, um, let us know and we can help you with the install, but we're also planning kind of an installation party. I'm sure everyone's idea of a good party, <laughs> but um, we are planning on doing it together uh, step by step. So if you ran into any snags or you just don't want to deal until you have someone walking you through, that's absolutely fine. We just shared it with you last week in case um, you were really eager to kind of jump in. Okay. And I got all the other um, Adobe stuff into my computer Super. by my IT people. So, okay. okay. That's them.
Alrighty. Well, um, for next week, please review unit two and we'll do something similar. Um, we'll be interested in your takeaways and any questions that you have of the content covered. And then um, we will discuss planning and building a publishing program. Uh, we'll have some special guests with us. Uh, David Reck, who is the founder and CEO of Scribe, will talk about mission-driven publishing and some of the work that they're doing and why they were interested in, in partnering with us on the co-op. You can pepper him with any questions you may have about Scribe. And then Carla Myers from Miami University in Ohio will be joining us and she's gonna talk about um, how her publishing program has gone so far, conversations she's had with her dean, how she's thought about doing the RFP process. Um, and you of course can pepper her with questions too. And as always, um, all of you are invited and encouraged to share your own stories. So I will do my best to get these videos up this week. Um, if you have any questions or want to continue a conversation in the meantime, please post to our Google group. And until then, I bid you adieu. Thank you. Farewell. Bye. Bye.